We also knew very clearly from years of work that it was critically important to tie teacher performance to student performance. There's no way you can tell me a teacher is amazing and their kids are not performing. Hi, I'm Ray Kess, Director of Education Policy Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, delighted you could join me today. Honored to be with my friend Kaya Henderson. Uh, Kaya started out uh, teaching a middle school in the South Bronx back as a member of one of the early Teach for America cohorts in 1992. She spent time with Teach for America. Uh, she, along with Michelle Ree, helped launch a very uh, influential outfit called the New Teacher Project, today known as DNTP. And uh, she later went on to be deputy chancellor and then chancellor of the Washington, D.C. public schools. Uh, she now uh, mentors, coaches, and shares some of the wisdom learned uh, <laughs> over lots of years of doing the work. Kaya, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Rick. So that brings us to really what I would love to talk about with you today, which are what are some of the things you've learned over time? What can young reformers uh, take away from some of your experiences, and what do we have to share? Well, let's start with that. You spent uh, close to a half dozen years as chancellor of Washington, D.C. public schools, getting a lot of recognition for some of the, you know, widely recognized improvements in play place. What are a couple of things that surprised you, uh, that you learned in the course of those years? I, I learned a lot <laughs> and was surprised by quite a bit at D.C. public schools. Um, I think going in, we knew that talent mattered, right? And initially when we got there, our theory of action was just get great people. And that led to a lot of the reforms that DCPS is known for, human capital reforms, teacher evaluation, pay for performance, you know, a revised union contract, all of those kinds of things. Um, but as we get, as we got and kept great talent, um, it became clear that that wasn't enough. Those great people needed support and resources and development. Those great people also needed to be engaged with students and families in ways that I think um, big systems don't contemplate. And so we saw our theory of action evolving really based on the feedback and responses that we were getting from our most valuable commodity, which were our teachers and leaders. And I think, um, you know, lots of times when I look at young reformers, one, young reformers think they have all the answers. Um, and lots of times they think that the people in the field just don't, either don't know the answers or can't figure out how to get to success. Um, but what I found is people in the field have tremendous, tremendous expertise. Um, but these big systems actually impede them from doing the things that they know are good and right for kids. And so I think um, young reformers need to enter this work with much more humility about the people that are working in districts um, and about what they have and haven't been able to do. I think you know, a big key to our success at DCPS is we're in constant communication with our teachers, with our principals, and later with our parents and our students to figure out what it was they wanted, what they needed to be successful. And our job as policymakers or as stewards of financial resources um, was to really enable folks on the ground to be successful. Um, and I think we enter the reform space believing that, you know, the folks who are there just don't know what they're doing. And I think that that's a, a terrible mistake to make. So, so let's, let's unpack that a little bit because there's a lot there, obviously. So one part of it is, you know, when Michelle Ree was brought into D.C. as chancellor by Adrienne Fenty and you went with her as her number two, there was certainly a sense, at least I think out there, um, that this was you guys against the teachers. Is that, was that how you initially thought about it? Was that people misreading how you guys were going about the work? I think that was people misreading how we were going about the work. So a little known fact is that I had been working in DCPS for seven years before we got there, um, as before I got there as the deputy chancellor. 
Um, I had a contract with DC Public Schools through the New Teacher Project, uh, where I was managing all of teacher recruitment for the district, all principal recruitment for the district. I had negotiated successfully a memorandum of understanding to change the hiring timelines with the teachers union. And so part of the reason why we were able to be so successful was because we had positive relationships with teachers and the union and principals when we walked into DCPS. Now we knew that we, because we had this experience in DCPS, we also knew that there were lots of things to clean up, but it was never about us against the teachers. We knew that there was some segment of teachers who didn't belong there, but we also knew that we needed to um, highlight and expand the span of control of our high performers, and there were plenty of high performers in DC public schools, um, and that we needed to figure out a really good mechanism for developing people. Because when you come to an embattled school district like DC public schools, you don't always have the kind of support and professional development that you need to grow. And so teachers feel like they're swimming against the tide. And our entire orientation was how can we make teachers better because what we'd known from doing nearly 15 years of work at the New Teacher Project was the single most important in-school factor for moving student achievement is the quality of the teacher. And so it couldn't be us against the leverage point, the linchpin, right? This is why we wanted to pay teachers more. This is why we wanted to recognize and reward teachers with the Kennedy Center event. We wanted to make DCPS the best place in the country for teachers. We had some work to do to get there, um, but it was never about us versus the teachers. So obviously that message didn't get out, at least in the early years. You know, is... people need, people like drama. People like good guys and bad guys. People like, you know, lone rangers on white horses coming to save people. And I think that we both benefited and were significantly hurt by the edulebrity that sort of surrounded the work that we were doing. So talk about that a little bit, and especially what did you learn about trying to make sure the message, because it seems like over the years, that sense of conflict between the leadership and the teachers changed in the ways oh, yes. you're talking about. <laughs> and so what did you guys learn to kind of, so, so that people saw it more the way that you wanted them to see it? Yeah, I, you know, I think that one, we needed people to understand that we were serious about change. As I said, I had been working in DCPS for seven years. Um, directly in the Human Resources Department. Before that, I was the Executive Director of Teach for America DC, so I had been working with the district for close to four years. And in that nearly 11 years, um, there were probably nine or 10 different superintendents. And so the posture when new superintendents came into the organization was for people to just cross their arms and wait, wait it out, because inevitably, you know, the, that person would be gone in short order. And so literally, we needed to come in with a different sense of momentum, a different sense of urgency to help people understand there is no waiting out. Like we are moving, we're moving fast, we're doing things very differently. And I think that that sense of urgency was in some cases misconstrued, um, in some cases sort of overblown. But, you know, you can't fight your way to success, right? I, I just have never seen an organization where the people who had to make the organization work like fought their way to mm -hmm. a great outcome. Um, you only get to success when people work together. And so I think um, what we were able to do, and you know, again, the communication stuff really, I think, hampered us in lots of ways. Uh, we were able to change the narrative first by not talking to people outside of the organization. When I became chancellor, um, I watched how bruised people were from all of the back and forth in the press. Um, and people felt like Michelle had really made her kind of fame on the backs of this local context. And I wanted people to understand coming in as chancellor that they were my priority, that local was everything for me. And so for the entire first year of my chancellorship, I would not attend any national conferences. I wouldn't take press with any national reporters. I only spoke to local reporters. I only did things here in DC. And for me, that was about making sure that people understood that my priority was nothing but this city, these kids, these families. And then when the sort of moratorium <laughs> was lifted, um, I felt like it was really important 
for people to hear and see a different story about DCPS. People had decades worth of of anecdotes and and images about how terrible DCPS was. And they hadn't seen much of the progress that we had begun to make. And so it became very clear to me when we started doing really positive things and had good news and nobody was covering it that we needed to change how we were communicating. And God bless social media, which allows us to go direct to consumer, right? And not wait for the Washington Post to tell us, tell our story or somebody else to tell our story. And it allowed us to tell our story the way we wanted to. And so it meant me opening up a Facebook account and a Twitter account and an Instagram account and showing people the DCPS that I was seeing, showing the amazing teachers, showing the great new programs that we were putting in place, showing kids achieving at high levels. And we asked all of our schools to think differently about how they told their story, all of our central office folks. And so, you know, a couple of years ago, I was really excited when we won somebody's award or another for having the best social media presence of any school district in the country. But we seized that to create a different narrative about DCPS and to um, help people get a different level of confidence in the school system. One piece of this, uh, especially the professionalization of teachers, is the DC Impact Program. Mm -hmm. uh, teacher evaluation that a lot of folks have pointed to as a model as states have tried with mixed success to benefit. Can you talk a little bit about why you guys think it worked and a little bit how it's evolved over time? Sure. So <clears throat> we went into this work in 2007 thinking, again, human capital, just get and keep great people. And we that meant three things. That meant recognizing and rewarding our highest performers, developing our middling performers and moving out our low performers. But when we got to the district, 90 something percent of teachers were rated as meets or exceeds expectations when only 20 some percent of kids, 23 percent of kids were meeting or exceeding expectations on the statewide test. So it was a huge disconnect. We literally could not tell who the good teachers were because the evaluation system, which was a one page checklist that maybe you were observed and, and got that feedback and maybe you didn't, it was so um, ill-conceived and inconsistently implemented that we knew that we needed to create a baseline and set expectations around what teaching would look like in DC public schools. And the way to do that is through a teacher evaluation system. It lays out very clearly what you want to see, how you want teachers to teach. And by providing them with observations and feedback, they get, they have a clear understanding of where they are and where they're struggling, where they're excelling, and you can move from there. We also knew very clearly from years of work at TNTP that it was critically important to tie teacher performance to student performance. There's no way you can tell me a teacher is amazing and their kids are not performing. And state tests are part of that, but only 13% of teachers teach in tested grades and subject areas. Can you explain, when you say only 13%, what do you mean? So I mean teachers who teach grades three through eight, um, three through eight, nine, 10, and 11, English language arts and math for the most part. And then there are all of these other teachers, pre-K through two, um, and then up the grade span that don't teach in those major subject areas. And those people need feedback and growth and development as well because developing kids' artistic talents is as important as developing their test scores. And so we needed an evaluation mechanism for art teachers and music teachers and PE teachers and you know science teachers and social studies teachers. And so we designed a system that took into account um, how teachers were teaching through observations and we hired experts, expert teachers in those content areas to provide good feedback for teachers. We also looked at student performance, in some cases test scores, in other cases goals that were set with the principal and the teachers, a set of goals that we pre-approved because we wanted them to be rigorous. But you know, we created a, a system that had multiple metrics so that teachers had different opportunities to show where they were against our expectations. And um, it was, you know, it was pioneering at the time. Um, but I think the most important thing that we did when we started Impact was we called it Impact 
to signal to people that we were putting a stake in the ground around teacher evaluation in ways that had never been done before. But we were also, we knew that we were going to have to iterate on this, right? Because, you know, our best first guess was, couldn't be perfect. And so we wanted to create the space. And teachers said, well, are you going to change this every year? And we said, no, because we don't want you to feel like the goalpost is moving every year. But every three years, every year we will tweak in ways that, you know, might improve, but wouldn't radically change what you're trying to do. But every three years, we'll do a big kind of refresh. And and I think that gave teachers a level of stability and confidence in the system. Um, the same way we started Impact is the same way we iterated, which was talk by talking to lots and lots of teachers. I mean, we held 140 listening sessions with teachers, groups of teachers, before we even put pen to paper. And throughout the process, through every three years in terms of um, the the evolutions of impact from you know teachers saying five observations is too much if i'm good can i go down to three or teachers saying you know what this one score was an anomaly do i have the ability to drop a score and all of the things that teachers asked us were quite reasonable um, they weren't trying to game the system they literally brought good thoughts to the table and we engaged with them as co-creators i think of the system and so when the park was coming for example and none of us knew what our scores were going to look like or so this is the new common core line test not new common core line test um, our teachers were very nervous about how this would impact their uh, evaluation scores and so I decided to waive teacher um, student test scores in the evaluations for two years. One, year one, just for us to sort of see what the test was and see how we were doing. And then a second year so that teachers had a little run up before uh, it started to have consequence for them. And while I got my hand spanked from the U.S. Department of Education, um, and I got lots of flack from policy people who felt like we were softening our stance on teacher evaluation. It was the rightest decision that I could have made for my school district, right? My teachers felt a level of comfort and, um, and like we want people to do their best work and put their best foot forward. And so they knew that for two years they had some grace period. At the same time, we used other other student achievement metrics. So we were still incorporating student achievement. And then in year three, what we saw was incredible progress, both on the park and on the NAEP. And I think part of that is because we listened to our teachers' concerns and then made the appropriate adjustments. And they knew because we said the whole entire time, year three, it is back on and popping. People were like, that's cool. I can, I can do that. So I think, you know, when I think about what I would tell a young reformer, um, your policy might be incredibly right, but you have to manage how people actually implement these policies because you could in fact undo a really good policy because you didn't manage the change appropriately. And it just seems like that is something that in DC you guys were positioned to do well because you were working directly with the mayor. There's not a state managing lots of systems. And it seems like one of the things a lot of well-intended folks in states ran into is they were trying to write statewide laws yeah. for lots of districts. Yes, districts are so different from one another. Um, and, you know, even within a district, there's so much diversity around school type and blah, blah. And, you know, I think we like the policy lever because it's a hammer, right? And when you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so we think by writing one law, like everything changes. And what I can tell you for sure, and we've talked about this in cage busting, right, is that uh, there are easy ways to get around policy. There are easy ways to get around mandates and whatnot. Um, and so I think, um, just because you've written a policy or you've instituted a policy, it doesn't mean that the implementation will go well and it doesn't mean that people won't work around it. So let's, let's stay with this cage busting point. This is something that I think <laughs> that you've always been incredibly thoughtful about. It, it is as you, you know, as we would talk during your years as chancellor and before, you would talk about ways in which you had figured out how to make things happen that folks frequently said, gosh, there's no way to make that happen. Yeah. 
Can you talk, is there an example or two that comes to mind? And you talk a little bit just about the habits of mind that help people and school systems solve problems like that? So I'll be really honest. I think that um, me never having sort of advanced through a school system um, gave me a very different perspective on the problems that school systems face. And, um, and so, you know, lots of things that hamstring people my, you know, people sort of run up against these walls. And my thing is, okay, if we can't go through it, how do we go over it or under it or around it? Um, part of that, I think, comes out of uh, my time as executive director at Teach for America, where I had 50 kids to place. And when the human resources department at DC Public Schools told me that they weren't going to place my kids, I, I mean, these were people's lives who were on the line. They had moved to DC to teach, and I had to get them jobs whether the district was going to cooperate or not. And so I hit the road and I went out and talked to principals and got them all placed myself, right? Um, at TNTP, you know, where we were delivering for clients and they were paying us, if we didn't do what we said, no matter what the state regulations or whatever. So first I had to go to the state regulator and say, can we change this? And if they said no, I had to see if there was a loophole that I could drive a truck through so that I could get my client what they needed. And I think that orientation, um, you know, is what took me um, to my cage bustingness at DC Public Schools. Um, may, shall, does not mean must, right? And, you know, just because you've been doing it these ways, like what do you have to do and versus what do you not have to do? And I just started asking lots of questions and challenging these notions of, you know, must do or can't do. And what we found were lots of opportunities that could be maximized. Hey everyone. Thanks for watching part one of our discussion with former DC Schools Chancellor Kai Henderson. If you enjoyed what you saw, remember to like the video or leave a comment. And if you want to see more, check out part number two.